looking back at the college days, it was Oklahoma State. Did you get offers? Did either you and or Jack get offers from Oklahoma? Oh, yeah. I mean, Jack had actually signed a football scholarship to play for the legendary Bud Wilkinson at, uh, at uh, OU. But uh, Myron Roderick, uh, the wrestling coach at OSU, was such a sharp mind and, and knew his recruits so well. He knew Jack was wanting to be a professional wrestler. Uh, he had a, he had an ace up his uh, oh, uh, his arm. Uh, he being uh, Coach Roderick, he knew that uh, the promoter in Oklahoma was Leroy McGurk, who was also an Oklahoma State alum, a two-time NCAA champion, that promoted the the, the Oklahoma territory. So, um, Coach Roderick called over to Leroy and told Leroy that Jack had signed a scholarship to play football, but he wasn't giving up on him. Wanted to know if Leroy would go over to visit. Jack and then tell him, hey, when you get out of school, I know you want to be a pro wrestler. When you get out of school, you know, there'll be an offer waiting for you uh, at, at uh, Oklahoma Championship Wrestling. And uh, so uh, Jack walked away from that scholarship at OU for, for football and, of course, signed the uh, Oklahoma State uh, scholarship. And, but he, he, was a, he was a great football player. He had scholarship. He got a lot more offers than me. I did because he was such a great two-sport uh, star. He, had, he had probably had close to 80 scholarship. I remember those envelopes coming. It was pretty exciting for a little brother to see all those schools. Uh, the great Bear Bryant sent him a letter. And then uh, uh, Dan Devaney, up at, uh, was, uh, the big legend up in Nebraska football at the time, sent him a letter. Uh, uh, Dan Devine, a Missouri coach that was sent to a famous coach. He he had letters from all over the country. I, most of mine, I was a little bit smarter than Jack, so I, most of mine were wrestling scholarship. I had Colorado, I had uh, 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 Michigan State and OU, and uh, Tommy Evans, matter of fact, had refereed a lot of my matches. You know, I had summertime wrestling, well, summertime wrestling in Oklahoma, so it, it's a kind of open division where college kids and high school kids could kind of, at that time, could, could enter, they'd be in the same division. So I was at a summertime tournament, and uh, Tommy Evans, the coach at OU, was uh, was uh, refereeing one of my matches, and the match happened to be against one of his ex-national uh, champions. And I took him down a couple of times, and I had a guy was I was wrestling a couple of weights heavier than what I should have been, but I always like to do that just to get used to the bigger guy. You know, when then when you wrestle with your guys your weights, you, you could handle them a little, a little bit easier. But I was handling this guy easy, and I ended up getting put on my back, and I got beat by a point. And uh, after that match was over, Tommy come over and said, kid, I really like to fight. And I'm only a junior in high school at this time. I was one of my national champions. You gave him everything he wanted. He was lucky to beat you. He said, keep an open mind when when, when, when you're looking at scholarship. He said, I know your brother be headed uh, still with your brother, but keep an open mind. I, I'd really like to have you there. And sure enough, he offered me a scholarship. But, uh, my mom was going. I wanted to actually really wanted to go to Colorado. I took one of my recruiting trips out there, and in those days you couldn't get cooler beer anywhere but Colorado. <laughs> so when I went out there, they made sure I got my fill of cooler beer. <laughs> they told me you can't get this in Oklahoma. You know? <laughs> and I said you're right. So I went home and I was really leaning towards uh, leaning towards Colorado and. Uh, and it came time, and uh, Roderick came over one day with the paperwork signed by Henry Iba, the legendary basketball coach at OSU, and uh, and him, and, and stuck it in front of me with my mom's signature, and and they kind of looked at me, and I was kind of as their mom said, sign it. So I picked up a pen and signed the damn thing. So I ended up at Oklahoma State. So you know, we had scholarships just about anywhere we wanted to go, back in the Midwest, you know. That is awesome, and it's just it's so funny because. Today, the kids, the kids would, not all kids, but a lot of kids would just do whatever. But back in the day, if mom or dad said, sign it, you signed it. <laughs> you signed it then. You didn't ask no questions either. And when, when that actor, when Robert left, she did, oh, why would you ask the mom? I, I, you know, she knew about the Colorado deal, but she, she knew I wanted it. I said, I really want to go to Colorado. So, you know, I leave going 500 miles away from home, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I did, you know, I stayed there, so whatever. Hey, it all worked out. It really did. And it's interesting you mentioned about Jack playing football because both you and Jack could handle yourselves. 
You were excellent wrestlers. You, as you mentioned too, I mean, you weren't like physically big, huge. But could Jack? Do you think Jack could have played NFL football? He got he got he got a letter from uh, Tom Landry wanting him to come down for a free agency try. Even over the year he started pro wrestling, he, he was out of school. He got a letter from the Dallas Cowboys said, uh, signed by Tom Landry said, Jack, we're inviting you down to a to a free agent uh, a tryout in Dallas on such and such day. We'd like you to attend. Please, please respond to the letter. Of course, Jack wanted to be a wrestler, and he did. Cowboys were just starting. I think that was the Cowboys' first or second year at that time. So he he, he really wanted to, we wanted to be pro wrestlers. Danny Hodge, you know, was our hero growing up. Hodge was on TV. That's who we all the boys in Oklahoma want to be like, be like Danny Hodge. And I got Danny Hodge living with me now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> and he's very quiet too. <laughs> well, he scared that thunder away. You don't hear it barking. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting with your legacy because singles wrestling, tag team wrestling, and not only with Jack, but I mean, I was reading the list. You were a tag team champion with the likes of Bob Backlund, Rocky Johnson. Ole Anderson, Thunderbolt Patterson. I mean, it just... Don Morocco. Oh, my gosh, Don Morocco. I didn't even know that one. I mean, it, it, it's just amazing. What do you think? What do you think about, other than wrestling with Jack, just what was it like teaming up with some of the other talented wrestlers that you teamed with to win championships? Well, the best time I ever had was, needless to say, Don Morocco. Don and I were really tight friends and, and really, really tight. Don was such a uh, great athlete. He played football out at Cal. A lot of people don't know that, but it, Don was a heck of an athlete coming off that island. So he was a lot of fun to be with. Bobby Backlund was, was a machine. I mean, just a machine. And you didn't have to worry about being overworked when you were tag teaming with the with, uh, with Backlund because he would do most of the work, you know, because he, he just liked to go out there and sweat, you know. And, uh, so he was fun. Rocky Johnson and I, we had a ball together. Uh, Dwayne came up to me at uh, at Rocky's uh, funeral and told me how, how much his dad had loved me and how much he enjoyed uh, being my partner. And I guess in, his, in, in uh, Rocky, Rocky Johnson's book, he, he said I was his favorite tag team partner. And I did not know that, you know, but I know he was one of mine. Ole Anderson, that was a business thing, and it was Ole Anderson. So uh, it, was, it was fun. It was a contrast. But, you know, it wasn't a contrast of style because Ole believed in working his ass off and believed in wrestling. So we kind of blended in good in the ring together. Outside the ring, we were oil and water. But inside the ring, we, we, we could work together and put together a storyline of a match to make it work. So, uh I, I and Thunderbolt Patterson, and I, I had Sandy Scott. When I first went to Carolina, which was my first territory where I got my breaks, was in, was in North Carolina. They put me with Sandy Scott first. I always tell everybody, Sandy Scott taught me how to be a tag team. Because Jack and I had teamed up in, uh, at that time. Our plans, Jim, when we first started, you go your way, I'll go my way. We'll end up in separate places. You get over and I get over and we can exchange with each other. And that's basically what we did. He was over in Florida, I was over in Carolina. They'd do on a tag team up in Carolina. They'd fly Jack in. They needed some down there in Florida. They'd fly me in from Carolina. And so we had the best of two worlds going on at the time. But Sandy Scott, I always tell everybody, Sandy Scott taught me how to be a tag team partner. And he was so good and, and so precise and so... He was a demanding partner in the ring to just on details. He was one of those detailed guys that wanted everything just perfect. And it was good for me because I was a young kid when I teamed up with him. Didn't really know a lot. He taught me how to work tag team. Then I became tag team partner with Thunderbolt Patterson. I told him about Sandy Scott taught me how to work tag team. Uh, Thunderbolt Patterson taught me how to make money in a tag team. So Thunderbolt was Thunderbolt Patterson. He was uh, Dusty Rhodes before Dusty Rhodes ever come along. Hey, you listen to Thunderbolt's original interviews and you listen to Dusty's inter interviews, you close your eyes, sometimes you can't tell which one is which, you know. And Dusty always said that, that he got a lot of his stuff from Thunderbolt Patterson. And Bo had the one of the best promos ever, ever, ever in the business. He was, he was so much fun to work with. And uh, get it down, we're in, in the early 70s, 
the 1970s, going through Carolina as a, a, a white guy and a black guy and a black on black El Dorado Cadillac going into work North Wilkesboro, North Carolina, where there'd be a big sign up that said, Welcome to KKK Country. Oh. Carlo would look over me, he said, I guess I know who's buying the beer tonight. <laughs> <laughs> And it's interesting because Thunderbolt and Rocky Johnson, just two wrestlers, two men that broke color barriers. And that was just during those times, like you said, you see KKK sign or something like that. But once you see some of the different ethnic groups that would cheer, it didn't matter. It didn't matter what ethnicity you were. You were cheering for Thunderbolt Patterson. You were cheering for Rocky Johnson. And they never compromised themselves either to do any of the stereotypes, which I thought was interesting and all as well. Well, that's what made them pioneers because you're exactly right. They didn't compromise themselves and they didn't step fetch it for anybody. These, these guys were two true men. And uh, Rocky, I mean, I, I used to say, hey, you know, this guy can punch like, uh, he can dance like he can shovel like Mohammed Ali, but punch like George Foreman. He don't just stand up. Rocky, don't do that. Don't do that. Somebody <laughs> might stand up with that. We'll knock him out. You know? <laughs> you don't knock him out, I'll take him down, then you can knock him out. <laughs> Hey, when you were teaming with Thunderbolt, did you ever get a word in edgewise on promos? <laughs> no, and I didn't want to. Why would you want? Why would you want to interrupt uh, music like that? I mean, you know, it's like somebody singing in the car to a great John Lennon. To, you know, yes. you're singing the word, but you're not saying it. You're not, you're not, you're not matching the harmony. Yet. Bo had such a rap. I mean, he, I would usually open it up and then cut to you know, throw the pat, the patterns, or the uh, thunderbolt, and uh, he would, he would just crank it out, man. And and those people in North Carolina have would had never witnessed anything like a thunderbolt Patterson up to that time. And it's also, I mean, really cool. You mentioned about Dusty because you can take wrestlers like uh, Dusty Rhodes, like superstar Billy Graham, even boxers like the great Muhammad Ali. And they all sort of borrowed, which is it's not respectful, it's good to do, but borrowed from Thunderbolt Patterson. That's exactly right, all of them. I mean, uh, and, and they, you know, they, they, they know they did it, but they sometimes, you know, it, it, it's not fair to Thunderbolt that Thunderbolt don't get a lot of that that credit for for starting that style of promos, you know. And, and uh, but well, he's he's still a wonderful guy. He, he's a good friend of mine. Last year, um, you know, he went up to Iowa. I'm, I'm on the uh, board of directors of the selection committee of the George Tregas Lopez uh, Dan Gable Hall of Fame up in uh, Waterloo, Iowa. We have a big uh, honors week every week, and I brought Thunderbolt up and. Uh, People were a little skeptical because they'd heard all this stuff about Thunderbolt, but uh, Thunderbolt went up there, and before he left, he could have run for mayor of his hometown of Waterloo, and it probably won that weekend. He got over so much. And he was just typical Thunderbolt Patterson, a pleasure to be around, and, uh, and by the time he left, he was the most popular guy in town. That's awesome. And, hey, like I mentioned, and then you also uh, just gave the, I guess, the okay or approval Muhammad Ali was a we know this was a big wrestling fan big pro wrestling fan he did the thing with Anoki but I mean that, that trash talking came from pro wrestling and at that time nobody was doing that better than Thunderbolt so it really was it was a cool era and a really cool time as well and just to hear your story about 
really learning from him how to draw money and just how to show is really cool as well. Now, Jerry, you're living in the sort of the west, south, central west Florida area, the Tampa area. You've been a long time resident there. And I'm wondering this, the WrestleMania 36 host, Rob Gronkowski, Gronk, now he's going back with the Buccaneers, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, formerly coached by Lehman Bennett many years ago, as you said. <laughs> Gron Gronk's the 24-7 champion. Could we maybe see a Gerald Briscoe showing up at Buccaneers practice, rolling up Gronk for, to add that title? You might see Gerald Briscoe showing up at Tampa International Airport. You know, we decided, we just had you know, the NFL draft, of course, was uh, last night. I know this will be aired later, too, but whatever last, last night was, what date or what. But anyway, it was last night as we're talking that we drafted a, a, a our number one draft pick was a, Force a tackle to take care of Tom Brady. Well, they drafted not only a football player, but this football player, the two-time Iowa State champion wrestler. So I put out a little uh, little note to the guy. I said, "Hey, welcome to Tampa. You know, uh, well, well, I said, you know, I got an issue with one of your teammates. Uh, I, I was looking for you know, some support with one of that 24/7 back. And I, I, I sent a couple of texts, uh, Twitters out to, to Gronk, and I know he's busy right now. I'm not signing autographs and cashing checks and all that stuff. But Gronk, when you get to my house, this is my house now, not somebody else. It's your house. Not not no doing a patriot house. This is my house. I uh, the stadium is your stadium. I grant you that. But Tampa is my house. You're not going to walk around very long with that 24-7 uh, title. So that's a challenge. Answer me if you're mad enough. If you're not, you know, I'll see you at practice. That is so cool. And you mentioned, I, I looked it up, too. But Tristan Wirfs, the offensive tackle from Iowa. So they took him in the first round, obviously, like you said, to protect Tom Brady. But I didn't know that about his wrestling background. Well, is you got to know these days, Jim. I mean, yeah, come on, I'm a fan, you know? <laughs> you know, and you know all your amateur wrestlers, too. Is is that someone, did you get to see Tristan wrestle then? Is that someone you think that might have a future in pro wrestling down the road? At six foot five and 335 pounds, I would say yes, he would have. <laughs> And he's a very, very personable young man, too, from what I see and what I hear. So I'm going to welcome him to town. I can't wait to meet him. I'll meet him. I, I go down to the Bucks down there. I'm pretty well known down down around Tampa Bay, Buccaneer land. And I, we, when, when Bucks first opened up, you know, when Frisco Brothers Body Shop was around at that time, and we had a record service, one of our best customers was uh, John McKay. John McKay and Curbs here in Florida had a hard problem on usually on Thursday nights, you know. I don't know what it was, Tuesday or Thursday night. But uh, we, we told his Cadillac in so many times, it's unbelievable. And most of the time we would just get it get it out fast, bring it to the shop, and, and you know, and, uh, call him the next day, Coach, we got your car here. Guys, please, well, don't worry about nothing to eat. We, we took care of McKay, and he took care of us with the Bucks, sending the Bucks over to our body shop. So we had a, we've had a great relationship with, Buc with the Buccaneers from day one. So it, 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 I'm, 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 I'm thrilled to death with what we put together. And I don't look long term. I'm looking next year, you know. We're going we're gonna to play in our own Super Bowl. That's awesome. And you mentioned about the size of Tristan Wurst, the offensive tackle that they selected in the first round, the Buccaneers. There was another big guy back in the day that you and Brother Jack are credited for discovering, a Terry Bollea, is that true? Right here in Tampa, Florida, yes sir. He was a local kid too, you know, and uh, he was playing in a rock and roll band over by the University of South Florida. And uh, we happened to go into that, that, that uh, establishment one night and saw him up there. We'd seen uh, Terry several times sitting in the back in the crowd, you know, in the back row. And this guy, this big, big guy sitting up real tall there. So we went in, and here was this guy we'd seen at the wrestling matches up playing in the band. Holy cow, that's a big dude. So the young lady serving beer uh, was a good friend. It was actually next door neighbors with Terry. She's the one we used to have to call to give him bookings to because his mom actually did not want him taking bookings. Did not want him being arrested. Brady would get hurt. So we 
we had to call, I can't even remember the girl's name, but we had to call her to make sure that he got his booking. So we booked Gary several times. He knows show. And of course, I called him. Well, I never got the message, you know. And Mom never gave him the message. So she was a relay guy. But anyway, we told her, you know, we want to talk to talk to that guy. So he come down. We sent him down. Story story. He went down, worked out with the hero match. And the hero cranked, uh, cranked his ankle. I don't think it broke it, but it gave him a severe bruise and swelled up the size of basketball. We didn't think we'd see Terry anymore. And the next morning, he showed up ready to work out with his ankle tape and his boots of lace on tight. And went, oh, man, that kid got some heart. So the rest is history, as they say. And that, for those that most would know, Hulk Hogan, of course. And it was an interesting part of the story because if he, and that's the generational changing, if he listened to his mom, he would not be pro wrestling. There would have been no Hulkamania. <laughs> For Ger Gerald Briscoe did listen to his mom and had a great career. Hulk Hogan, not listening to his mom, had a great career in pro wrestling. <laughs> yeah, but we'll always say, listen to your mom. <laughs> yeah, we will. <laughs> we, we will. We will. We'll do it that way. <laughs> hey, well, did you know, though, I have to ask this, though, about that story, too, and the question. He was going to the wrestling matches as a fan, but did you guys know he was playing in a band, or that just sort of happened and you saw that? Had no clue. Had no clue who he was. I mean, we just, you know, you know how you, uh, you just get up in the ring, you know, you're, you're eyeballing, all of a sudden, you know, you boom, something takes your attention. Well, Terry had a full head of hair at the time. Hulk had a full head of hair. Bleach spot. He was a big superstar, Billy Graham fan, uh, truthfully. And so he did come to Tuesday see superstar Billy Graham, and, uh, He'd sit down on the floor, but he'd always sit way to the back, you know, never, never up front. I don't know because most of those seats back in those old days were regular customers. Those first five or seven rows, you know, you, you could, you could, you knew the faces what you tip because they'd been there every week. But uh, the back, the back end of the rig side, you know, were new faces back there. And he'd check those rows out. We'd see Terry set back there. Well, not every week, but, you know, weeks where he could come and his band was playing or whatever. And so we had no clue who he was, what he did, or you know, why he was there, except he was a fan. And then when we walked in the bar, I still didn't put two and two together until a couple of days later. And he mentioned, hey, I have to work out to the matches a couple of weeks ago. Oh, man, I'm, I am who you are. So... You know, we put two and two together at the time. But we, no, we didn't know at the time at all. It was just a chance meeting. Yeah, that's crazy. Wow, how that happened is just crazy. And then from there you go. And then from there, it just it took off. Uh, it was just, wow. So I'll, we'll wrap this up. I thank you so much as always taking the time. We just had WrestleMania 36, and it was just so different. Obviously, because of coronavirus, it couldn't be at Raymond James Stadium near your neck of the woods right there in Tampa so they had it at the performance center and it was two nights no fans a lot of great reviews fans media just everybody doing their thing what was your take of the two nights and just how it all played out I, I watched both nights uh, uh, twice and, and, I, and, I, and I'm a fan uh, no less I mean I, I'm I just have so much respect for the talent that that participated in, in WrestleMania 36 and, and the matches that they that they go. It is so hard. Hard shut up. They say I told Dave hard shut up. <laughs> so, but these 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 young men and women they went out there to keep the intensity, Jim. That that you got to keep and keep it at an upper level that you got to keep for WrestleMania without any feedback whatsoever is so hard to do and these young men and women they went out and they they put on the, the shows of their life they had great matches would they have been better with the live audience probably but how much better i don't know if they could have gotten much better because they still went and they put the effort out there and the, and the desire came through i was so proud of my peers and uh, my, my younger peers and uh uh, people in, in the future are going to look at this thing and, and wow, how'd they do that? Because anybody, you do anything with, without any reaction. It's just so hard to keep up the intensity and the emotion. And the emotion especially because you're not getting any feedback on what you do. You know, you're, you're in shock. And 
hear the grunt and grunt of each other. And, and, and he, uh, but he, 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 as a performer, you know when you did something good in the ring, and you're going to wait for that 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 explosion that you get from the audience. And you know that explosion wasn't there. And if that explosion that wasn't there, even with a live audience, when you don't get the pop that you think you're going to get, you lose some of that emotion and you lose some of that intensity. And these, these young men and women did not, they kept that emotion, they kept that intensity up. I was proud of the product. I was proud to be a part of the WWE at that time. And, and I, I, was, I was just singing the praises of every one of those young men and women. I loved the show. It was, it was really just, all the, and all the different things they did too, it was really cool. All right, I'll wrap it up with this. So did Morocco ever take you to Hawaii? Well, listen, everything you do, I, multi-talented. I didn't even know about the Orange Grove. I learned some, I, that I learned too and all. So you, you've wear many hats, sir, and one, worn them all well. Gerald Briscoe, Jerry Briscoe, Jerry with a G. You're a legend, a Hall of Famer, and thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it, Jim, and you guys take care and stay healthy down there, all the folks down there. Stay inside until they tell you not to. Be careful. Uh, I want to see you around because I plan on being around.